ਲਾ ਤੂੰ ਕੁਝ ਚੀਰ ਪਾ ਕੇ ਰੱਖ ਲੈ ਪੱਲੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਮੁਖੜਾ ਲੁਕਾ ਕੇ ਰੱਖ ਲੈ growing up i didn't have a lot of representation to look to you know i had um baljeet from finnis and ferb shiral gupta in diary of a wimpy kid and uh like that the indian kid in jesse who is the same as shiral gupta south asian representation has been increasing in western media ever since the the late 90s into the 2000s into where we are now we've been on a like a like an upward an upward slope if you will as far as representation goes and i think nowadays we do have more representation than we've ever had before but what steps did we take to get here and what missteps and horrible horrible mistakes from apu and the simpsons into where we are now and and, and how is it that she who shall not be named figures into this journey Over the next however many minutes this video ends up being I I want you to 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 come with me on a journey through Daisy representation in western media over the last 20 something years and I want to show you how we went from Apu to polite society and everything in between. Uh so I've made for you here a little road map as you can see. This is this is the map I spent a lot of time on this. So first, disclaimer. First of all, yet new setup. This video took forever to record and also make. So, I had to reshoot some parts and between that time and this time, I got a haircut, I shaved, and I got a completely new setup. So if you see me in any clips of the video shooting from here, don't freak out. Okay, enjoy. Okay, so before we start, I want to get some terms, terminology, definitions, all that kind of stuff out of the way cuz I'm going to be saying some things here over and over again. And I know some of you fucking nerds out there are going to want to know like, "Oh, what do you what do you mean when you say exactly?" I'm not trying to make those are it's good questions and that's why it's in the it's in the videos because they're good questions. First of all, South Asian. What do I mean when I say South Asian? Well, you guessed it. It is people from South Asia. Yeah! So first of all, yes, South Asian. Uh when I say South Asian, I'm referring to people from South Asia. I'm re- referring specifically to people from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bhutan, etc. Brown brown people. I'm talking about brown be- brown people from Asia. If I say South Asian, I I'm I'm saying brown people from Asia. The second term I want to define here is representation because it's a very important one that's used a lot but we never really talk about what exactly we mean by it specifically. The hardest part about defining a word like representation is how fluid it is. So, I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. When a brown person shows up on screen, that is representation. From Pasin Patel in Life of Pi to fucking Sri Shumbhaji in Pirates of the Caribbean like 3. For better or for worse, any time that a brown person spends on screen is representation because it is quite literally a representation of a South Asian on screen. Of course there's many forms of representation, there's many ways to do representation. There's a lot of styles and I'm going to be talking about a few of those forms in this video, but to touch on that now would be spoilers. <laughs> Yeah, so those are the the two big terms that I'm going to be using a lot of that I just want you guys to know. I would recommend that you guys read this book. I know reading, oh god, you're going to make me read a book. I want to die. I want to throw up. And... I know. You don't have to read it. I'm just saying I read it and I really liked it. It's called South Asians on the US Screen just like everyone else. Um it is by it is by Bhumi K Thakur. I my fucking stupid library has the big old label on it I want to take it off fuck libraries am i right guys i hate getting knowledge for free yeah i'm going to be referencing this book a few times throughout this video it's really good it's it's written very well and it's very interesting and i i really like it so go read it finally before we start a disclaimer i'm going to be covering a lot in this video so fucking much there's a lot that i'm going i'm going over like 20 years worth of movies in however many minutes this video is i'm not going to be spending too much time on one movie rather i'm going to be examining characters very broadly and movies very broadly and just talking about what they mean for representation as a whole 
So if that means that I don't get to talk about your favorite movie for as long as you would like, I'm sorry. Don't light me up in the comments and be like, oh, Baljeet got a little attitude not talking about Mississippi Masala. I know. I'm sorry. I could make a 30-minute video just about Mississippi Masala and what it meant for interracial couples in movies. After that, I could make a 30-minute video on the lesbian undertones of Vendit Like Beckham. But those videos aren't this video. And I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm sorry. All right, enough dilly dallying. Let's get into it. Stop! Good God, man! You almost got the cheese Dutch. Shirag Gupta is a excellent example of what South Asian male representation was, largely through the early 2000s and into the 2010s. South Asian men were comic relief. They're small not conventionally attractive. They're either complete math wizards or gas station owners. There's not really an in-between. And most of the time, 99.95% of the time, I would say, you can bet your bottom dollar that they're going to be doing a funny accent. Every magazine cover had it. Popular movies of all time, sir. What? What are you thinking? Let's go see if you fit in my man purse. <laughs> I'm Jura Gupta, and I'm single. Wow. The crazy thing is most of these actors that are playing these parts are American. Karan Brar is an American. He's he's an American guy. He's just, he's doing the accent for Shirag and the little twerp from Jesse. Accents were used in, in this time period as another tool to other South Asian characters in U.S. and Western media in general. Comic relief is always a lot funnier when they have a funny accent and the Indian accent became this sort of like token to distinguish these characters from the usually white main character. It's kind of a clue in to let the audience know that they're allowed to laugh at these characters is because they're doing the silly little accent. They're doing the thing that the, these characters have always done. Basically, uh, in the early 2000s and 2010s, South Asian actors and characters were sort of a, a sidecar show. They show up, they do a funny bit, they have their funny thing. It's usually related to their South Asian-ness. The white folks get a little chuckle and then they leave. And that's kind of their, their whole character, largely. And the crazy thing is, you don't even have to be Indian for it to be funny. Sometimes it's funnier when you're not. Apu is voiced by a white man. Ashton Kutcher did Brownface in 2012. Master of Disguise was a movie. What did you <laughs> that is a big reptile. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay, so the thing about Master of Disguise, though, is that I, I used to really, I had a huge Master of Disguise face when I was young. In that scene, it's actually, it's a, the character is white and he's doing, he's doing brown face in the movie. Like diegetically, he's doing brown face because he's a master of disguise. And he's trying to show that like, oh, I, I'm white, but, but I'm, but you could believe that I'm, I'm digging myself into a hole here. Uh, don't go watch Master of Disguise. It's bad. It's a bad movie. Don't, just don't go see it. I, we're, let's get back into it. Essentially, the, the the two big tropes that we see here are the, the smart Indian trope and the gas station Indian trope. But these tropes are largely geared towards South Asian men. South Asian women, on the other hand, get a slightly different treatment. They're treated in this almost like kind of like caveman way as these beautiful, gorgeous, like jewels of the Orient. Here, this is where you see movies like Bend It Like Beckham and Mississippi Masala. Although I will say, those movies do, in my mind, fall under the exception because they are pretty solid representation, um, but that doesn't mean that they're immune from being subject to these tropes and kind of like exacerbating these tropes a little bit. But I, I am going to touch on those movies later. I think you promise. Takor says it best in her book when she says, South Asian women continue to be eroticized and South Asian men are portrayed as non-threatening and effeminate. And this is the really big through line throughout the early 2000s into the 2010s and even in the early 90s is this is this is really how they see people are portrayed in Western cinema. We don't really get the buff, strong South Asian man fucking Kumail Nanjiani in The Eternals right now. We get uh, Raj Kutrapali who can't speak around girls 
whereas his sister has sex with Leonard like 15 minutes into her first show appearance. I could never bring a white boy home to my parents. <laughs> They'd have a cow, which is a much bigger deal in India. This is the trend that dominates, and it's a trend that's rooted in some pretty ancient stereotypes, and usually that that's all these characters are. South Asian men are funny little dudes, and South Asian women are eye candy, and their depth doesn't really extend much further. Usually. There, there are certain movies that come out that aren't perfect, but they set the foundation for the movies that are going to come after. Movies like Bend It Like Beckham, Mississippi Masala, obviously, and Slumdog Millionaire. These are perfect examples of movies that have South Asian characters. They, they put them in the center of the narrative, and they are allowed to drive the story. And that's not something that was really happening that much during this time. As I said before, these movies are still guilty of certain tropes, but they aren't the centerpiece of each of these characters' personalities. They don't dominate, they don't take up all of their screen time. Jess, Mina, Jamal, these are all fully fleshed out characters with goals, likes and dislikes, actual character traits. And like, I know, I know, oh, shouldn't all characters have those? Yes, yes, they should, but they, but they don't. And it, it, this, we were, we were going around scrounging on scraps at this point in time. So now, now we're here, we've set the groundwork. Um, the West is now aware that South Asian people exist. Um, they're starting to put us in things, whether they like it or not. There's a lot of us. Now we're, we're allowed to, to be in movies. So, so what's next? What's the, the next big thing that could happen? We need, uh, you know, I, I feel like we need something that... Of my new series, the sex Do you hear that? Minorities on TV can only deal drugs to escape poverty. <gasps> exactly. I spit truth without oh a filter. Like every no. comedian before hashtag me too. She's coming. Mindy Kaling, hallowed be her name, did a lot for South Asian representation in the U.S. media. I mean, she did like a like a lot. Her show, The Mindy Project, uh, had her as the only South Asian woman with her own network television show. She was a lead writer on The Office, which is one of the most insanely popular shows of all time, especially with white people. And entering into the late 2010s and into the 2020s, she spearheaded a lot of South Asian projects, including the hugely popular Never Have I Ever. So what is it about Kaling that made her so huge? What is it, what is it about her work that made it so appealing to Western audiences. Takor in her book describes Kaling's version of representation as assimilationist, which is how I'm going to be referring to it from now on, uh, as opposed to what I talked about earlier, which she refers to as the stereotypical. Kaling's portrayal of South Asians is an extremely white centric one. It's a, a version of South Asians that is palatable to white people because they're often just like white people. They talk without an accent. They're often confused about their roots. Then you'll go up to the front and you'll offer offerings to Ganesh. Like you're sitting there and a man is saying Sanskrit that nobody understands and you have to repeat it. And they're pretty much always romantically pursuing white partners. That was then. Nowadays, um, Kaling is known for... Um, uh, if I was hairless, I'd literally wear a bikini to school every day. No, I don't want to. We're not going to talk about that. We're, I'm not going to talk, be talking about that. I refuse to watch that. So I'm, I'm not going to. We're not. I'm, <laughs> we're not. Gonna. We've got these kind of like two schools of representation in media now. We've got the assimilationist, which is Kaling's, and the stereotypical, which is what we saw earlier on. Assimilationist portrayals of South Asians, such as Kumar and Harold and Kumar, are exactly what they sound like. They are a portrayal of a South Asian that has fully assimilated into whatever culture they're immigrated into. And then for all intents and purposes, they are now just like you. While this approach isn't, it, it's a lot less overtly racist and it is a step in the right direction. It's not exactly end game. I mean, do we, do we really want South Asian representation to boil down to us acting like white people? Mm. Young Stalin could get it, right? You could have been on Riverdale. Assimilationist narratives have the tendency to go too far the other way. And it, effectively, it, it almost acts as South Asian erasure. I love sports. Which is probably why it's so popular with white liberals. It, it essentially presents to 
white America in, in Kaling's case, a depiction of South Asians that is um, a lot easier for them to digest and a lot easier to process because a lot of what makes us South Asian is effectively removed. Or if it isn't just removed outright, the hesitation that characters approach it with in whatever media Kaling writes is the same hesitation that she expects white people to approach it with anyway. Iceberg wedge salad. Kitna gora ye restaurant Hotel ke fridge mein biryani hai. Hindi bola kara. So essentially, this is the kind of like media that Kaling starts to promote is this view of, of brown people that is a lot easier for white folks to to see and enjoy. And it kind of brings about a new wave of, of brown media. Although I don't have the uh, statistics to prove that this is the case, I think it is interesting that around the same time that the Mindy Project starts to close, but shows like Never Have I Ever come out, around this like period in the 2010s that Mindy Kaling creates content that more and more white people start to consume, we see comics like Aziz Ansari start to get more popular, Hasan Minaj gets his own show. The United States starts to warm up to brownness a lot more. And with that came this discussion of stereotypical versus assimilationist narratives uh, and their representation. And this discussion is also talked about in Aziz Ansari's show, Master of None, which aired on Netflix. He talks about being an actor in New York City and struggling to find parts and having this sort of like brown voice follow him wherever he goes. We need you to do an accent. You mean like an Indian accent? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I'd rather not. I just feel kind of weird doing that voice. Is that okay? You know, Ben Kingsley did an accent in Gandhi and he won the Oscar for it. What's interesting though is even though assimilationist narratives are attempting to combat stereotypes by assimilating their characters, they end up just reinforcing them just in a different flavor. For example, the focal point of a lot of Kaling's narratives are brown women, which is great. In stereotypical narratives, brown women are just eye candy, and that's kind of like their entire character. However, in Kaling's narratives, although brown women are the center of the story, a lot of their plot lines are centered around sex and either their lack of being able to have sex or the fact that they have too much sex. In the same vein, as I touched on before, a lot of the love interests for these brown women are white, meaning that assimilationist Indian men don't get a chance to be sexy, attractive. They are still weird little funny guys for the most part. So at, at the end of the day, is it even really that much progress from the stereotypical narrative or is it just wrapped up in a different bow? Mindy Kaling and, and artists like her in this time start to introduce the United States to the assimilationist narrative. And by doing so, consciously or not, she acts as a bridge between the stereotypical portrayals of the past and the, what I call, Daisy Renaissance of the present. You see my kick? Of course I bloody did. It was magical. The, the modern sort of Daisy Renaissance that I'm talking about, it's not really a renaissance, but it is the most good representation I've seen in a while. I wanted to end this video on a more hopeful note, so that's that's my attempt to do so here. I think the modern day Daisy Renaissance is broken up into two sort of waves of representation. We have what I call the new assimilationist wave and the race blind wave. Polite Society is a film that I think is a part of the new assimilationist wave. It's the story of a family that has come to England, they've assimilated, but it doesn't exist at the expense of where they came from. They're allowed to be Indian and British. Ali in Squid Game is a very similar deal as well. He is existing in this in this Korean show as someone that is South Asian but is also Korean and the two are able to exist together. I think that's what makes this new assimilationist wave so exciting is because it is this marriage of the two cultures. Polite Society specifically is also I think a response to Kaling's view of Indian women. It does center these Indian women in its narrative but the plot that is built around them isn't one that is built on the foundation of stereotypes that we've seen for so long. Wanna help me with a vid for my channel? Please! No! Please! No! It is, it's a twist on the classic sort of like marriage story plot, but it doesn't mistreat its characters by making this marriage story their only defining trait. It is a response to the original assimilationist wave that shows audiences these characters are more than their heritage, be that their old heritage or their adopted one. 
The other sort of subsection of representation that makes up this Daisy Renaissance is the race blind wave. I think the perfect example of this is the Green Knight. It is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It doesn't take race into account at all when it comes to casting or telling the story. It's usually seen in sci-fi and fantasy where race isn't acknowledged in the way that it is in the real world. Um, another example of this is the master from Doctor Who. When you have a character that basically fucking respawns over and over again and is an alien, race isn't really going to be recounted in the same way that it is on planet Earth. Similarly, The Green Knight is an extremely absurd film, and it's clear that the rules that apply in the real world don't really apply in the same way there. So we are able to get representation in a way that is completely unique from any other place that we could really get it. So these two camps are really, they, they make up the majority of modern Daisy representation, and I think they exist as natural evolutions of what came before them. The new assimilationist wave is hyper aware of the stereotypes of the past and often exists as a response to it, but that's not its only purpose. It is deeper than that. It doesn't combat those stereotypes by going way too far in the other direction. And then the race blind wave just does away with the concept of race entirely. So now we've got this completely new evolution of representation, and I'm very excited to see where it goes after this. I'm pretty sure I drew blood. <laughs> Movies from across the world are, are increasing in popularity in the United States as well. This is breaking the rules because it's an Indian movie, but RRR was huge in the West. It was massive. It, it completely shatters this notion that's brought up a lot of times when arguing about representation in movies. A lot of people will say that, oh, I mean, white people only want to watch movies about white people. The white people are the bad guys in RRR. There, there, there is no reason why people in the United States should in, enjoy a fucking Indian Revolution movie so much, except for the fact that I guess we both like to stick it to the British. But I don't know, man. They fucking, they fucking ate that shit up. They will fucking not do not do all over the place, bro. White people love this fucking movie. <laughs> I think the lesson to be learned from RRR is that good movies will attract a crowd and South Asians are allowed to be in good movies now. We have finally, there's, there's still the South Asian gas station owners, there's still the South Asian doctors, but we have broken past that barrier and are now allowed to, you know, be fucking people, which is great. I think, I think representation is on the way up and as soon as I break into Hollywood, I'm going to fucking... It's, you're not going to see a white person again. I have spent the better part of my life uh, beating back ravenous Indian relatives with a stick when they asked me what I want to do with my life or with my career. Admittedly, it hasn't been the easiest job. All this to say, I, I'm coming at this uh, from the perspective of a South Asian lad just trying to make it in the industry. And it's really just great to see that more people that look like me are, are starting, to, starting to get in there. South Asian representation is definitely on a positive trend um, in the United States and the West. And it's, it's very, very exciting to see. Thank you guys for giving up however many minutes you gave up to watch this video. I really, really appreciate it. Go fucking enjoy your day. Have a wonderful day. Go watch Dev Patel do something. Okay, great. That's it. Thanks. Bye. I'm a Karina, 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 I'm a Karina,